Okay, well, I think maybe it's time to give Stina a break and then move to our the last section of our um, marathon series of workshops today, uh, which is to have an open discussion. And um, um, so, is there anybody who has any um, questions or points that they would like to make? Now's the... Now's the time where it would be good to, um, uh, for people who don't have questions but have points uh, that they want to make, this is the time to actually bring out a point which can act as a stimulus for further questions and discussion. Steen. So, so since, I, since I have the microphone, uh, so, so one thing that I was, you know, when you go to meetings, then uh, sometimes you get really excited. I, I thought it was wonderful to, to sit in, in this workshop here. And uh, <clears throat> just to give some, some examples, I, I, there's a, I think there's a one-to-one -one with a number of the things that uh, Chirochi was talking about and, and what I would call uh, uh, evolutionary expansion. And also, Josh, what you were talking about, as you change the morphology, uh, what you're really doing is that you are expanding, um, uh, the, expanding the, the, the what's it called, the configuration space. And uh, and I would I would say in, in my terminology, I would say that then as you expand that, you might be able to uh, to uh, to solve new tasks. So that's the way it goes. So so I would say that the task axis. Depends on um, depends on your morphology axis. So Agreed. if you want to be minimalistic, you could just get you could maybe get away with just two axes. Yeah. So um, and and I don't know. And, and the other thing is also what what uh, what what you I think stated very clearly that uh, what um, which made me very happy that uh, <clears throat> uh, that many of or maybe most of the people in in population uh, genetics they don't get it. Because they have this, they, 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 they get stuck with the genotype phenotype uh, representation, and by doing that, it, it this can't capture what's really going on, and I think that this is what you came to that conclusion. Um, so, anyways, I I don't want to stimulate anymore. I don't want to have <laughs> room for other people to. Yeah. Uh, okay, just to uh, follow up on that, just a comment that. There is actually a lot of activity in the theoretical biology literature just in the last few years on the question of innovation. And, and so I, I, biologists definitely, um, I mean, it's not as if they are um, completely oblivious to this problem. And there, there's been a lot of work recently. There was a special issue last year of the Proceedings of the Royal Society on innovation. And there have been a number of very um, interesting uh, review papers uh, in various uh, in various journals within the last few years. So it's definitely a hot topic um, there. And I mean, from my talk, um, I was wondering. Um, so the, this picture of different of uh, exploratory open-endedness versus transformational or expansive open-endedness, and really. Um, it's these sort of moving into different dimensions of the possibility space, which are the interesting things. So uh, it got me wondering, well, is, is there anything more um, to open-endedness than exploring a search space and then having an in innovation which will take you to a different dimension or uh, domain of interaction? Um, so the question for us really is, is there anything that we're doing in this workshop that isn't being done elsewhere, that we're just maybe not so much aware about? Um, and I think there is. I, I think, well, certainly, as in all of artificial life, it's the synthetic aspect of actually trying to build systems. Um, and so there's the process of building systems. And, and by doing that process, you tend to ask and answer different questions than perhaps what the biologists do, even if they're looking at innovation. Um, so they're, they're just some thoughts I had. Um, it would be nice somehow to connect more with these, with this um, increase in interest in innovation in the biological literature, I think. And hopefully, I don't know how, what's the best way to do it, we can invite some of the key 
biologists, people like Ursh Safamari and uh, Gunter Wagner and Andreas Wagner, um, any other Wagners? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the more the better. <coughs> yeah, so just some thoughts. Yes. Thank you. I well, would like to congratulate the organizers of the workshop. I think it has been a big success. You managed to attract a great array of, of talks. And it's just a suggestion, uh, you don't need to answer now, but just to consider whether it might be, it, it might make sense for the next ELAC conference to organize it rather as a workshop, uh, but as a special session within the conference. Maybe you can discuss about it later. So, um, I, I missed, I had a workshop during the day, so I missed <laughs> most of the talks in here. And so if, if this was talked about, then, then fine. But I, I seem to notice that a lot of the discussion in open-endedness has to do with the organisms and um, levels of um, uh, hierarchy, um, and added complexity to the organism and the ability for the organism to, to um, take advantage of its environment more. And I'm, I'm interested actually in a different question, which is, uh, I, I mean, I think that that's critical. I think that's part of it, right? Obviously, in nature, we see things get more complex. But I'm also interested in the ability of natural systems to change in response to the organisms, that, that an organism, by being present, can become a food source for another organism. Right? And so that, that through evolution, we, um, we see niche creation, and, and w I can imagine a relatively <coughs> flat hierarchy of organisms where the complexities of organisms are not vastly different. But as more phenotypes appear on the landscape, more niches open up, and that this could be an angle of open endedness. And, and then if you had both uh, increasing complexity in organisms and increasing complexity of ecosystems, that, that that may be some some solace. But that was talked about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> as, as I said, I think we agree. Yeah. yeah. I um, um, think that one one thing that's been represented pretty well in a couple different talks is this idea of uh, um, uh, that instead of modeling <coughs> evolving systems with uh, things that you specify, um, uh, you, it may be better to go down a level and, and model um, something from which the things emerge. And so this, I think, is the spirit of um, a broad variety of, of um, artificial chemistry models and, and and we've heard a couple of, of from a couple of data points um, but I was wondering if we could hear from the person who literally wrote the book on artificial <laughs> chemistries about what you think is is kind of the state of the art of um, open-endedness and the spectrum of of um, artificial chemistry models that you're uh, familiar with, which is like the whole spectrum. What? Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, not a question, though. Yeah, that's sort of a difficult question. I would say, I mean, artificial chemistries are a way to get rid of optimization, mm -hmm. and um, through the combinatorics that is present in those systems, um, have the expansion and the richness that we have seen in, in various talks today. So so I think it puts the finger on, on the right button, but I'm not sure whether we have reached a point where we can say, yes, that's that's a model that, that uh, fulfills all this, this um, uh, criteria for um, open-ended evolution. But I think um, it, it is the right question to ask whether, whether we shouldn't go to this very powerful combinatoric level of systems um, and dispose of um, fitness uh, or selection as, as a criteria um, um, to, to follow. Yeah, that's not saying something about a particular system, but in general, I think that's... Uh,
I mean, certainly what I uh, love about artificial chemistry is that it allows me to do bottom-up engineering without actually doing engineering. Uh, um, and I think the <coughs> distinction between top-down engineering and bottom-up engineering is really sort of shot through the whole uh, discussion or controversy to the degree it is a controversy about how to proceed to understand open-endedness. When you're doing top-down engineering, you're uh, trying to achieve fitness for purpose. You're, you're trying to make something that will achieve something that will be good. When you're trying to do bottom-up engineering, you're trying to find sets of things that play well together. And in fact, in order to actually engineer any system, you need both. I mean, to engineer any successful system, you need both. You need the physical elements that play well together, and then you need fitness for purpose that somebody will pay for, uh, uh, like that. And so a lot of the traditional approach to genetic algorithms and so forth, where you design the creature, you're doing fitness for purpose. You're doing top-down design of an adaptive system, like that, which is great. But then it leaves open the question of how do you go to the next step? How do you get it to you have a community of these things or whatever it is? You didn't do any of the work for playing well together. So now you have to start to do the bottom-up engineering at the level of the creatures that were not engineered for that, which is why I like artificial chemistry. You can say it's all moot, because you, you have to make multiple level transitions sooner or later in order to really get open-endedness. But at least when you started artificial chemistry, you're saying, I am already trying to find things that will play well together so that they can be open to larger scale structures. I think that, that um, uh, one of the appealing things of um, Steen's perspective <coughs> is uh, that, that both things are actually going on, this expansion and optimization. Nature, a lot of... Uh, um, uh, kind of evolutionary narratives that you can you can uh, stories that you can tell from evolution are optimization stories and yet uh, Ken's picture of the tree of life illustrates uh, 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 in a spectacular way that that uh, uh, there's something else radically different going on and but both things are going on and and it's 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 pretty clear that that um, uh, not all of the diversity in nature was produced by um, just random novelty search algorithms it's it's quite clear that that uh, a lot of uh, what nature is doing is evolving um, uh, well it's it's optimizing after a functionality has emerged. It's this emergence of functionality that I keep coming back to as something that we need to get a handle on. And uh, in a sense, this is emergence of purpose. And um, until we really understand how purpose emerges and then, and then components are kind of marching around with their own um, feeling of what, what their purpose is, um, and components are opti optimizing themselves uh, with a sense of purpose, um, how that emerges, I think, is, is, is a, a key question. And I don't think that we've got a handle on that yet. Mm. Right. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure it's more of a comment or a question, but uh, what makes me a little bit confused, you mentioned something about getting back levels, and uh, how, how long, how much can we get back in levels, should we get back in levels, like, uh, for instance, it, as Josh said, like we should evolve uh, new actuators or new sensors, uh, but we're still constrained to this space, and let's think of uh, neurocontrollers and then you're still stuck to neural controllers. But if you get back to any levels, if you get back to the level of uh, chemistry and then you get back to physics, and should we keep getting back infinitely to get back to the primordial soup? And we have to think maybe that um, it could take uh, forever. To this, the more we get back, the more it takes time to achieve something. Uh, so uh, how worth is it getting back? Or uh, I'm not sure. 
Yeah, Ken, you have a response to this? Oh, I mean, I think it's a valid point to think about this um, because we've had a lot of um, a lot of arguments in favor of the the low level approach. But th I think this is one of the, the big risks of the low level approach. Is I don't really know the exact probabilities of life arising out of a chemical soup, but I think it's like really low. Um, and so, like, short of that happening, and given that the probability is it won't happen in any of our lifetime, um, like what? what might we be expecting to see happen that will really inform deeply us about open-endedness. Um, and so there may be a limit to what we can extract from such systems, which isn't to say that they're not worth pursuing. I mean, that's not my point. Um, but certainly the, the, what we're calling top-down, I actually think top-down versus bottom-down might be the wrong way to make this dichotomy, because they're not really top-down. Um, but these other to three levels to the point where I can use the silicon manufacturing technology that we've already invented for CPU and RAM for something that's much better, for something that's an artificial chemistry that will produce the kind of stuff that we want that we will then be able to stamp out by the square meter and compute better. So it's not an intellectual pursuit to say, is there some magical ground level conceptually? It's, we, I want to branch out and use this to make the world a better place. I think it's also really easy to think of this as a system at A level. And one of the points here is we want to dive down into those low levels so that we can use them in the higher levels, so that we can build this level, these levels up so that when we find at a higher level, we've got something happening, or we're not getting the emergence we want, that we're not getting the complexity of behavior that we want in a cell model, for instance. Maybe being able to dive down and give it a lower level of complexity, give it more detail lower down, that might be what we need to get those higher levels of things. And so in some ways, it's about dealing with scaling. So yes, if we just run the artificial chemistry suit, Almost certainly, if we just run that, it will never produce life. Uh, if you stick RNA in a petri dish and shake it, you could be there forever and it just won't produce life. <laughs> I don't know how much you feed it. But by starting with these systems, or by starting at all the levels and working out how we link them up, how we connect these levels so that they can all work together and help each other, then all of us who are happy working at different levels can help each other. Yeah, I think that that resonates quite well with Ken's point, and, uh, and I agree with it. Basically, I, I buy the point that Ken made in your, that you made, Ken, in your talk, 
that really, ultimately, there's a very pragmatic reason to understand this, because it's a big deal if we know how to do it. And if we know how to do it in really productive ways, that's going to be starting at this high level that we're already at right now and making it happen some more. And so, so it definitely makes sense to understand what's happening at the high level and not just a primordial soup. Uh, yes, Alyssa. So levels is definitely one of my favorite things to think about because you know, the more I think about it, the more I'm actually not convinced that levels uh, actually exist. Uh, so uh, um, when I think of things like chemistry and physics and astronomy, these are all things that uh, we've invented. These are scales that we <coughs> we we see a level of observation level of observation, and we were able to make a description of the system on that level of the observation, but. That's something we did, um, and beyond that, I I, I just want to like say some sort of crazy thing. I don't think levels exist, so I don't. I mean, that's not a useful statement, but maybe it is. So just throwing that out there. Well, you are made of cells. You wouldn't deny that, right? Um, no. <laughs> Jordan. Uh, one of the things I guess I would like to see in this community, uh, I don't, I haven't bought into the whole fully open-ended vision that Ken set out, or the AGI vision that Josh <laughs> laid out. Uh, I'm always much more interested in can I build a learning system that develops intelligence or complexity over time through the dissipation of CPU time. In other words, if I, if I had a fitness function that said, how intelligent are you, I could do it with hill climbing. Right? I just generate an epsilon change from the current system. Is it more intelligent than it was? You know, just climb that hill. And of course, that, that doesn't work because there is no fitness function which is more intelligent. So we have to figure out a way. So. What I would like to see is a, 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 a intermediate sets of goals for the community um, that we can see real progress, that people can, you know, can claim they got the cherry, they got the blackberry, they got the, uh, you know, the apple result, um, because if we hold out, really for the full vision of open-ended evolution, uh, you know, the development of, of hierarchy starting with uh, artificial chemistries without fitness functions that have been developed later. I just fear, you know, we're just pissing around for a really long time while the deep learning guys just keep raising billions of dollars in venture capital. <laughs> so I, I think we need some intermediate goals for this field, goals that are that are doable. Uh, I'm going to follow up the, the Jordan's comment. So my question here is: that the, Do we have a goal? Yeah. We do. I don't know. That actually, it's a genuine question. I think. I don't know, Ken had the goal when he was eight years old. <laughs> so I, the, last four, the last four speakers, I, I've heard purpose, I've heard fitness, I've heard intelligence, I've heard um, levels and observation. I'm just, I missed one session, so maybe it was talked about, but I'm surprised that we're not talking about observer bias, right? So the emergence of of purpose in a system. There's an observer who says there isn't purpose, and now there is, and I have a definition for it, or a, a definition for intelligence. And if not to put words in Dan Dennett's mouth, he's not here, but I will presume to speak for him. You know, we're, we're, we're walking into the intentional stance here. And, you know, the role of the observer in all this was a very important part in my reading of the original work in artificial life is, you know, 
we're, we're talking about things that keep getting bigger and break outside of the box and dimensions and expansion and all of these are subjective human, you know, they're, they're, they're tied up with the human observer. And I, I don't have an answer, I'm just, I'm just making a comment. I'm, I'm surprised we don't talk about that as much as our community used to. Maybe just some food for thought. I think um, Dave Ackley was, made a stab at, at um, uh, articulating uh, an approach to which could in principle yeah. analyze uh, uh, arbitrary data in the universe to find um, something that we might, we might want to call living uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. without well, it, it's still subjective in yeah, the sense yeah, yeah, that yeah. we choose the statistics uh, that we choose to use to look at the thing, and that's going to determine where life is going to pop out and so on and so forth. I have no problem with that. Uh, uh, I have learned that there are people who still believe in objectivity that get pissed off uh, when I tell them, no, actually, you did that. Uh, uh, you picked a space-time window when you opened your mouth. And they said, no, 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 this is actual truth. Uh, uh, like that. So I, you may not have heard it, but you, it's sailing under the radar. No, I, I agree. And I think, you know, this idea of, of really being rigorous about what we observe, right? This is a start. So if I say, I see purpose now in this system, and it's because that red blob in the PNGs turned are green. Going toward each other. It, at least I'm forced to speak in your language, which is PNG files, right? And then you can argue with me that that's not purpose, but at least we've made progress. Uh, so I, I definitely appreciate that, that approach. Uh, somehow I got a mic. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, one thing to point out is, I, like two years ago, I, I, I had a paper in the, the workshop called on the role of subjectivity and in the interpretation of open-endedness. So I, I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. That's like really important thing to recognize and kind of digest is the extent to which um, the ability to make progress requires accepting that there's some subjectivity in what's going on. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, but I also um, was thinking about uh, Jordan's point um, where um, he doesn't buy into the full something that I said. Um, but I... <laughs> um, and um, I think but I, but I actually agreed with the argument that you made. So, so I think like that. I think it's also a good point that um, there needs to be. Um, yeah, we don't want to just be playing around forever. I think that's a, like a really important point. Like, yeah, like the deep learning thing sounds like kind of a joke. Like, okay, there's some billions of dollars pouring in, but I mean, there's something. There is something wrong if we're missing a gold mine sitting under our feet and just playing around with toys. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Like, if we actually believe that this kind of stuff can produce real value which to me, nature looks like a huge amount of value, um, that we should be getting really serious about like producing that stuff. Um, and that means being a little bit critical about like, is this ever gonna lead to something uh, of practical value? Um, this isn't necessarily a criticism of anything, but just that it's, it's something to, I think, think about um, getting serious at some point, and, like actually trying to think, and maybe not, yeah, not necessarily Let's see if something amazing happens with this really low-level system if we just play around for the next 15 years. Like, let's actually try to get a theory together so we can see something happen quickly. I, I think it's a really good point, and I think one of the things we need to be aware of with that is value is not always in the systems we're building. Sometimes it's in the systems we're building to build the systems. So we had earlier two different programming languages being created in order to build a system. And I think one of the things we can often miss, because we're so busy wanting to build these low level or high level, or whatever level you want systems and look at the artificial life stuff, is sometimes we may be coming up with something really fantastic in the middle of all that that would enable huge amounts of things in other fields. So we might be coming up with an analytical tool that could help, I don't know how many biologists or something else, and sometimes we're just quite bad at looking at those because we're too busy being interested in it in our little world of a life and artificial life and all this, and we're hoping we're going to get value out of that. At, let's not forget the side, <laughs> side products. <laughs> so, when in, in the context of like purpose and uh, and goals and sitting on gold mines. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what people think of 
finding the next biggest prime number. So like if emergence or if uh, open-endedness is equivalent to um, that, that thing which the sum of its parts are not equal to the whole. So like it's kind of analogous to I think finding prime numbers and, and the space in between is like the, the compound number. So I mean, I, I, like, uh, some people might think it's kind of useless to find the next biggest prime number, but um, there's a point where like we subjectively add meaning to it. So that's, I mean, uh, my, my point is that uh, I feel like open-ended evolution at some point becomes equivalent to just finding the next biggest prime number, which we can all agree that, okay, maybe it goes to infinity and that's fine. The, the, the interesting part is when we can make meaning out of it, when we can make the world better or, or uh, make money out of it or, you know, do something like that. So I think, I think in terms of, I, like, I don't know, it's just kind of sort of like food for thought. Like, what do people think of finding the next biggest prime number? Do you guys think that's analogous to what open-ended evolution would eventually become once we sort of understand the process or how to go about doing it? Yeah, it's hard for me to um, think that the that finding the next prime has a usefulness uh, comparable to understanding open-ended evolution. I think it, it's probably... Uh, Mm -hmm. There's more to it. Yeah, yeah. I think um, going off that, you, you said an interesting word, and also you mentioned it too. It's one of my favorite words, the E word, emergence. Um, I think this idea of emergence is actually uh, a lot, uh, uh, I guess, scarier than um, maybe we're we're not giving it. I think maybe we're not giving enough attention to it. This idea of emergence, going from level to level, what does it mean, right? Because um, I think maybe something like finding the next big prime number. I mean that's fine, but I think it, it, at least from an intuitive sense, we're we're, we're not really changing any levels. We're not, there's no sense of emergence there. It's just a, a faster way to solve a problem, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But like um, when I think of things like flocks of birds, right? Um, there's actually there's there's as of right now, there's no way that we can. Um, predict what the emergent behavior is given the rules of an individual. Like for a cellular automata, there's no way we can say how big a triangle is going to be in the pattern based on what the rule table is. And I think maybe drawing more attention to this idea of emergence will actually help us understand open-endedness um, in a much better way than we might be realizing. Wait, there's no way as in it's impossible or there's no way as in it's there's so many possibilities that picking one out picking the one that comes out is is improbable like what do you mean by that uh, I think the the way that I mean by that is kind of like um, uh, it's it's impossible because the level like for example how can we understand uh, if, if everything's made of atoms, right, on a very basic level, and we can describe how um, the hydrogen model works with Schrodinger's equation, just by looking at Schrodinger's equation and saying, like, well, that's how, you know, these, these um, particles behave, there's no way we can come up with how um, republic countries emerge eventually. Like, that's, just, that's just way beyond the space of, of, of what uh, Schrodinger's equation is uh, capable of. Yeah, I think we can agree on that. So um, I think maybe this is a good place to um, um, call it quits, that we're overtime, but it's been a good overtime. And um, uh, we still have a few minutes to uh, stretch our legs before the banquet. So let's thank all our speakers again and all of the audience.